Seven. Now, unfortunately, that is all the time we have left this evening. Please set your DVR. Never miss an episode. We will never, this is our promise, our pledge, our solemn vow to you, we will never be the Destroy Trump media. We are the fair and balanced part. Let not your heart be troubled. The news continues. There she is. Another night of kitten killing, oh. apparently, according to these calls. Um, Sean, I can't believe you, still, you guys still haven't heard my recorded message. You still got, you guys still haven't it picked it up. It fills up in like 20 seconds, the whole. No, 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 no. I left a message yesterday. You did you not. Yes, I did. And you guys still haven't managed okay, to pull it and play say? it on the show. What did you say? It was in a foreign accent, but it was very respectfully done. There was no cultural <laughs> misappropriation. It was all above board, but it's very specific, the criticism. So I need you to respond to it tomorrow. All right, we are going to be listening. <laughs> We're going to be, and we'll play it tomorrow. Have a great show. All right, Ingram's Sean. next. The Ingram Angle. All right, and good evening from Washington. I'm Laura Ingram, and this is The Ingram Angle. In light of his powwow with a number of pro-amnesty congressional leaders, should the president's core supporters panic? That's the focus of tonight's angle. As I noted last night, it was terrific for the president to let the sunlight in during that DACA back and forth at the White House. Transparency is long overdue in the legislative process. It's something I've been asking for for years. He was engaged and he was enthusiastic about having both sides at the table. That was really good. He also reiterated that the wall and ending chain migration was a prerequisite for any deal on the so-called dreamers. But not so reassuring was when this went down. You turn on Fox News and I can hear the drumbeat coming. Right-wing radio and TV talk show hosts are going to beat the crap out of us because it's going to be amnesty all over again. And then the president basically seconded that emotion. Thank you, Lindsay. You know, uh, it's very interesting because I do have people that are, let's just to use a very common term, very far right and very far left. Uh, they're very unhappy about what we're doing, but I really don't believe they have to be. Excuse me? <laughs> Lindsey Graham hitting Fox News? Well, that's nothing new. But the president hitting the far right? That's adopting the language of his fiercest critics on the left and many in the open borders crowd. Pretty surprising. And then here was the piece de resistance. This group comes back, hopefully with an agreement. This group and others from the Senate, from the House, comes back with an agreement. I'm signing it. I mean, I will be signing it. I'm not going to say, oh, gee, I want this or I want that. I'll be signing it. And here's the part that made Jeb Bush all warm and fuzzy. This should be a bipartisan bill. This should be a bill of love. Truly, it should be a bill of love, and we can do that. Wait, does that sound a little bit familiar? Yes, they broke the law, but it's not a felony. It's kind of the, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an act of love. Now, do you remember when candidate Trump ridiculed low energy Jeb for that? If you remember, he said they come as an act of love. Okay? Tell that to the families. And there are many, many, many families who lost a loved one. Act of love. Okay? There's no act of love. And remember candidate Trump saying this? No citizenship. No citizenship. No citizenship. No Everyone citizenship. agree with that? I mean, go a step further. They'll pay back taxes. They have to pay taxes. There's no amnesty as such. There's no amnesty. Listen to the crowd. So what happened? Well, maybe the president realizes that he's never going to get a wall unless he does that DACA amnesty. Maybe. And maybe he thinks he just can't end chain migration unless he gives legal status to those 800,000 illegals. They range from about 16 years of age to about 30 years of age, and not all kids now. But that is a hard pill for many of his most loyal supporters to swallow. Today, many of my radio listeners were in meltdown mode. We're not going to get a new wall. I, I'll, I'll bet my shirt we don't get it. We don't get Sean, it. Uh, I'll bet my shirt on that. If he breaks his promise and he grants amnesty to these dreamers, it's, it's, it's over. I think it's over. My kids were born and raised in America. We have dreams, too. You know, 
if we don't we don't obey the law, nobody comes and gives us free stuff. We are not far right when we simply insist on abiding by the legal immigration rules and national sovereignty. When did that ever become far right? I'm feeling deflated right now. Well, I did my best to buck up the listeners, but it wasn't easy. Now, it's true President Trump is winning praise for his newfound openness to things like comprehensive immigration reform. We all know that's mass amnesty. But he's winning it from some of the same people who are enemies of his populist agenda. And by the way, the same people who revile his supporters. I thought that it was great to see our friends in both parties in there. I think opening it up and letting us see them talk to each other, uh, there was a positive feeling about that. This is the presidency that many people thought Donald Trump was capable of. Just the notion of him being in command. I think it was very helpful both before the cameras left and, and after they left. That's the guy who wrote the book just trashing Trump and didn't even vote for him. Well, not so long ago, like yesterday, they were calling you, Mr. President, and your agenda far right, extreme right, racist, xenophobic, alt right. The president's new friends, the bipartisan cabal that's been pushing amnesty for years, have a few goals in mind. The Republicans, they want cheap labor. And the Democrats, they want new voters who are captive to big government. But there's another goal that the establishment hopes to accomplish. They want to separate Donald Trump from his base and break the spirit of the populist movement. Well, they're not going to succeed. They think they will, though, because people like Steve Bannon is sidelined, and they think their moment has arrived. The president has to remain loyal to his supporters and to his agenda, the one he ran on, the one that won all that applause and rave reviews at all those rallies where people stood in line for hours in the cold. And he has to be willing to walk away, yes, walk away from a bad deal, just the way Reagan walked away from a bad deal with the Soviets at Reykjavik. Look, we all understand that governance is difficult. And sometimes you have to get the best deal you can with the votes you're given. But I think Kevin McCarthy, who's not exactly an immigration hardliner, had it right when he cautioned the president yesterday during that meeting. He said, look, you can't agree to a deal that compounds the problem, a deal that ends up only attracting more illegals down the road. Right now we have another surge happening at the border and one that fails to fortify the border, really fortify it. Now, there's a possibility that President Trump is doing something else, and I'm going to leave this possibility open, that he's playing a really smooth game with Republicans and Democrats and the media. So while he conveys an openness to negotiating, you're great, Diane, no, you're great, Dick, I love you guys, well, he's forcefully staking out his ground and managing to bring all parties to the table, and it's not just that. Just this week, there are really encouraging signs. The president is actually doing the hard work of enforcement. He just announced that 200,000 Salvadorans who were supposed to be here temporarily, been here for about 25 years, are going to finally have to go home because guess what? The hurricane's over. And today, the administration raided about 100 7-Elevens, hunting for legal employees and going after the employers who are abusing them and abusing the system. This is the kind of robust, proactive enforcement that Americans expect and his supporters demand it. But when it comes to any DACA deal, the president has got to realize there are just two things that matter above all else. Number one, DACA is the only leverage the president has to implement his entire immigration agenda. And number two, Democrats favor granting citizenship to these illegal aliens because they believe it is the absolute key to achieving a supermajority, just like the one they currently have in California. They want that in every key battleground state. So there's so much more at stake than just the future of the dreamers. This deal could decide the fate of the country. I'm going to wait to see what the final DACA proposal looks like. But if it does not include a wall, a real wall, not a see-through wall, expect a political revolt from the base, which means losing the House and maybe even losing the Senate. And by the way, chain migration, absolutely necessary. So if he doesn't, if those things aren't in the deal or they're watered down so badly they don't really exist at all, we end up losing the House, the Senate. Who's going to be left to defend the president? Dick Durbin? Lindsey Graham? Or all those hard right people who 
host radio shows are on Fox News. The president did not promise his supporters an opaque electronic fence that only covers a third of the border. He promised them a wall, a big, beautiful wall. And unless it's built, less chain migration has ended, I fear, Mr. President, your most ardent supporters will write you off as just another politician who said something he didn't really mean. And that would be heartbreaking. And that's the angle. Joining us now for a reaction in New York is Monica Crowley. She's a senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research. And here in Washington, Tamar Jacoby. She's an immigration activist and president and CEO of Immigration Works. And Corey Lewandowski, former campaign manager for Donald Trump and co-author of the new bestseller, Let Trump be Trump. All right, uh, Corey, um, there are people, you heard my radio listeners, they are really worried. I want to hold out hope and reserve judgment for the final deal. But you heard this, the quotes from the president at that meeting. He'll agree to anything they say. Uh, it, the deal is going to get done. Uh, comprehensive immigration reform is coming. Uh, and uh, just that alone, and then, of course, throw in the reference to the hard right. And people aren't too happy, the ones who actually stood in line in the heat in the winter weather to see him. This president has made campaign promises that he needs to fulfill. And if you don't fulfill those campaign promises, what we will see in November is a retaliation against the president because he hasn't done that. And the first and biggest campaign promise that he made was to build a wall. I went to all those rallies. We heard the response. We saw that Mexico, we heard that Mexico was going to pay for it. This is a hallmark of the campaign that Donald Trump ran on to make sure that we're putting America first. That has been his agenda. That is what he campaigned on. And that's what he's going to fulfill as the president of the United States. Uh, Tamar, the uh, people like Jeff Flake, who didn't even vote for the president, he's probably in closer to you in agreement on immigration than he certainly is someone like me or, or the candidate Trump. He said the, the wall will be something like maybe 700 miles, but it won't really be a wall everywhere. It'll be kind of fencing and so forth. Would that be acceptable to someone like you? No, I think we need to secure the border. We need to do whatever it takes to secure the border. And there's, Jeff Flake is not the only person in Congress who's working on this, and he's not the only person who said the president was going in the right direction today. So did John Cornyn and some conservative senators like Tillis and Lankford and well, people Tillis in the is House. Terrible on immigration. People in Lankford's the House, not much people better. in the House like Goodlad and Labrador. There are plenty of conservative, tough, hardline Republicans who think we need a DACA deal and think a DACA deal is the way to build the wall. Yes, of course we so need security. So you can't build the wall. I mean, we, I think you're right. There's not the votes to do that. But obviously, right. you could physically build You could physically, build but wall, you, if you want to find the, the you, money, the way to get the money out of Congress, right, you but need people, some bipartisan but, votes. But if, if people actually thought that a fortified border was important, and you I recognize that we need uh, so we, the need, we need roads there. We need a wall. We need or, censors. You know, we, we need yeah, more yeah, men. We need, we need, we need a lot. We, we need, need lot. judges. We right. need all kinds of so things. So that is an absolute must to have. So why link it? to the DACA amnesty at all. What does the think, DACA think, amnesty have to do with fortifying our border? The president has been saying since the beginning, since before he was inaugurated, that he thought that we should do something for the DACA kids. But, so delink it. Why and does he it have was, to be linked? Well, why not have some Democrat votes and do it in a bipartisan way? What's so wrong? I mean, is bipartisan the, tip bad by nature? But the nature? Democrats are for enforcement, you just said. I mean, you're for enforcement. I not, assume you're not a conservative so, Republican. Democrats are... Chuck I'm Schumer not a, I certainly am a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. Okay, so, so Chuck Schumer has said many times he's for enforcement. Other Democrats, they're totally for enforcement. But they also want to do something for the DACA kids, right. as Monica, does the president. Monica, uh, look, I want to believe in my heart of hearts that there is not some major sellout in the offing. I can't imagine the president would do that. I mean, that would be the end of his presidency. He would, it, it, I, I think, you know, look, you already have people who are concerned about this, but if it goes ahead and does that, you know, I, I think. Now, few people have given him better advice than probably, you know, the kid sitting kid. He's a kid to me. Corey sitting here, myself, and a few others. Uh, but he has a lot of friends now, newfound friends who are calling him racist, sexist, xenophobic. It seems like yesterday. Yeah, I don't think he cares much about his newfound friends who are lavishing him with praise based on, on what went down in that meeting yesterday, Laura. Look, we are a little worried because we're so conditioned by establishment Republicans and others who have let us down over many decades, people on, on both sides of the aisle, frankly. This president is completely different. I think what you saw in that meeting, 
Donald Trump knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing with that strategic contradiction. Look, he, of all of his campaign promises, build the wall, inspire the most passionate support. I don't think he's going to let us down on that. His platform about dealing with illegal immigration once and for all, he knows he's got one shot uh, before the end of the year in the 2018 uh, midterm elections. He knows what he's got to do. He's got to start funding, uh, building the wall. He's got to end sanctuary cities. He's got to end the visa lottery program. He's chain got migration. to end chain migration. He's 44 percent of the green card holders this Absolutely. year. Absolutely. He's got to accelerate deportations yep. and he's got to unblock those immigration courts. I know that's a tall order, Laura, but this yep. president is up to it. That's what he promised He's and he keeps do his promises. Got to do it. He can't be whatever Durbin and Feinstein and, and Cory Gardner agreed but, but, to. I have Cory, I have thoughts for Cory Gardner later on in the show. People do not want to miss what I'm about to reveal about Cory Gardner. Um, Lindsey Graham said this today to any of us who would dare criticize these tactics. Let's watch. Those folks don't have to solve problems. The president does. He's got to work for, with Democrats to fix problems like immigration. They don't. They're pretty much outliers when it comes to where the American people are. His job is not to, to sell books. His job is not to carry a TV show. His job is to solve problems. Oh, thanks, Lindsay. That was, we, we didn't realize that. He's actually the president. Corey, take a shot at that one. Look, the president has been brought to Washington to solve the problems that this Congress and many before them have created for the last that 30 years. Created, that, that they've created. That they've done. Like Lindsey Graham Look, have created by leaving the border open. Laura, we've Not seen this for 30 anybody. years. They've had come the chance on. to fix the problems and they haven't done. So Donald Trump has now come in, passed a massive tax reform package, the first time since the Reagan administration. Which we celebrate. And what, what the president is going to do is to fulfill the campaign promises that he outlined. What we saw yesterday was quintessential Donald Trump. He brought the cameras. I in. loved he it. Hold those I guys, love he held that. those guys accountable. I love it. He should do more of it. Have them yeah. accountable on television. I agree. The Democrats hate that because they want to go and make this rhetoric and have these propaganda. But for answers. Lindsey Graham to be sitting at that table, you, you know, you, your friends stick up for your friends. When Lindsey Graham's sitting up at the table, and I like him personally very much, always have. Uh, Fox News and Hard Right. He tried this line in 2007. He went down in flames in 2007. They tried it in 2014. You know who's no longer here in Washington? John Boehner and Eric Cantor. You know why they're not here? Because they sold the country out primarily on immigration. Tomorrow, I want to go with, uh, with you on this. On the issue of chain migration, the Democrats have said, oh, I've been able to interview, they are not for reductions to chain migration. What is your sense yeah, of over this? time, know... over time, we definitely need to rebalance. Too much is family migration, not enough is employment-based migration. But it's a real, it's a, it's a, that's a historic change. We're going to change 200 years of history. We need to do it carefully. That's not right. And Democrats aren't going to be ready to do it, it um, right now across the board on this deal. Well, we'll make some, they can make, I'm, I think it's possible to make some changes to chain migration. Okay, right. But to totally change the system, well, I don't think it's going to happen just around. For the deal. record, we actually changed our immigration policy in 1965 for changing it from a merit-based system to primarily a bringing in the entire family tree migration system. Yeah, no, it which used is to be a country-based immigration well, system. But, but it wasn't it was, merit-based. It was very much it was when we were in industrial age when we had heavy And it was country-based and people brought people right. they knew from their that, right. relatives just so from their Fox country. listeners understand what we're talking about here. There are a million green card uh, grants every day, granted every, every, every year. year. And 44% are family migration. There are other family uh, uh, recipients that come in. Only 18% are jobs related yeah, immigration? But the, but, but the families work too. The families work too. Second cousin and, twice removed. The adult children. The, the aunt. Uh, the uncle. No, thank 99 you. 99.9% .9 of the no, families work, yeah, and they and families are. You don't. Republicans believe but, in families. The cheap labor families, for the businesses families, that your group families create represents. A, families, are they create not? A, families create yeah. a Families create a social a social okay. fabric. Oh, social like American families aren't the social fabric. Yes, we got a lot of families. But why would why would you rather have a bunch of single men workers? and not them families yeah. so they're better than we are no they're not better than that's, me. That's, that's what you think. No, though, that's right? not. That no, they're, the, not. the illegals no. coming in with uh, no. all the extended no, family think, are better than the no. American workers. I, no, I, I can't I keep think their families together. No, I didn't say anything like that. Immigration. I think immigration should be legal, not yeah. illegal. But some family migration is not a yeah. bad thing. Adult ad country, uh, spouses and back. children. Yeah, illegal people. Donald Trump said countless times on the campaign trail need to go home and apply the right way. That's the rule of law. If you want to change the law, change it. But I'm telling you something. Compromise on this thing is this going to be a bridge too far. All of you, we could have you for an hour. I wish we did. And by the way, how Trump is signaling a possible showdown with Bob Mueller 
over the Russia probe. Corey's going to want to talk about that. Plus, the president says Senator Feinstein may have broken the law by releasing a congressional transcript from that Fusion GPS. Is he right on that? That debate coming up. Senator Feinstein uh, apologized today very quickly to Senator Chuck Grassley, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, for publicly releasing the closed-door testimony of that Fusion GPS co-founder, Glenn Simpson. She said she was pressured to release it. <laughs> By whom? And then she added this ridiculous apology to the senator. The one regret I have is that I should have spoken with Senator Grassley before. And uh, I've got, I don't make an excuse, but I've had a bad cold, and maybe that slowed down my uh, mental facilities a little bit. Good Lord. <laughs> President Trump says Feinstein possibly broke the law. So is that actually the case? Let's discuss this with Fox News contributor and senior editor of The Federalist, Molly Hemingway, here in the studio, and Saul Smiley Wise. <laughs> Weisenberg. They put that in the prompter, Saul. That is so unfair. You're just serious. <laughs> in Raleigh, North Carolina, former deputy independent counsel for the Whitewater investigation. Okay, uh, Saul, I want to start with you. The president said this could have been illegal because, what, she was operating while under the influence of Robitussin? I mean, I don't know what she was doing That's here, it. but it, it's not illegal, is it, for her to release this? Just maybe unwise or imprudent. Yeah, I can't think of a law that it violates. It's, uh, it was an unclassified session from what I understand. Uh, the documents involved that he was talking about were, I mean, he's a private citizen, so uh, that's probably why he said she possibly violated a law, right? I possibly violate a law every single day. Most Americans do. There are a lot of uh, laws on the books, but I think she's safe. All right, we're going to get into who uh, Mueller has hired on his legal team with Saul in just a moment. But Molly, so it might not be illegal, but what is really going on here? What's the bigger part of this narrative for our, our viewers who aren't all that, you know, accustomed to understanding this whole Fusion GPS deal? Right. I don't think it was illegal, but it was very bizarre that she kind of blew up her committee. That's normally a very collegial committee, and that was a very weird thing for her to do. But the testimony was interesting. I think what she was, I think what's happening is that everyone's kind of coming to the realization that collusion isn't happening, and they're just panicking, and they're just throwing everything out there. But the testimony was interesting, and it did, I mean, it already included two things that were false. They, he said that there was an F that there was a mole in the Trump campaign, and he, he, the guy who said that walked it back. There was also the lawyer claiming that someone was killed over the dossier. He walked that back. But it did point to the FBI playing around with this. They did talk about the wiretap that they secured. And these are the things that remain the focus now. People are curious, was this opposition research used? Was it weaponized by the Obama administration to spy on an opposing political campaign? But if they release, they release one closed-door interview transcript, what, doesn't that beg the question of where, the, let's release all the others. I mean, why just that one? Right. I mean, the reason why you don't do it is because the, the investigation is still ongoing and you can corrupt witness testimony and whatnot. Right. But yeah, right now, the actual movement is to declassify that application for the warrant that was used. Spying uh, on, the spy campaign, on the Trump campaign. In order, so yeah. doing this was not a wise move if you're not wanting that to be declassified because the pressure ramps up. Um, Saul, I want to go to you on what the president said today, and we have the soundbite, uh, about perhaps being interviewed by the special counsel. Let's watch. Sure. Are you open to meeting with him? Certainly I'll see what happens. But uh, when they have no collusion and nobody's found any collusion at any level, uh, it seems unlikely that you'd even have an interview. Well, he didn't really answer the question, but can he rebuff requests to be interviewed and what would that then portend? Well, Mueller's got all the leverage here. Yes, he can rebuff it, just like Clinton rebuffs, rebuffed our five or six interview requests. And then Mueller can issue a grand jury subpoena. And then what's the president going to do? Is he going to invoke the Fifth Amendment? Uh, I think that'll be hard to keep secret, and I, th I think that'll be very tough. So really, he's faced... By the way, if he was a normal uh, client, a white-collar client, you would absolutely decline to have him speak with Mueller. And if you were subpoenaed to the grand jury, you would say we're taking the Fifth Amendment. But again, because he's the president, he's not a normal client. So he's got two options. You either have an informal interview with your lawyer in the room who can help control the situation, or you send him into the grand jury 
where he's all alone. His lawyer is outside, but realistically, he's not going to step outside ever after, after every question and talk to Ty Cobb. So I think if Mueller really wants to interview him, he can, he can force it by issuing or threatening to issue a grand jury subpoena. I think the best thing for the president to do in that instance is to have an informal interview, uh, if, if Mueller will allow it, and he certainly should, yeah. with Ty Cobb in the room with him, and to have it recorded. Unlike Hillary Clinton, Molly, and Donald Trump made this point, no transcript, uh, that no recording. She did on the Fourth of July weekend. The president always hammers that point, and he's right. Hillary no, he Clinton could, got just could, <laughs> seemed to just skate on this. Right. If he could get that Hillary Clinton special, where they don't record the interview, everyone around you gets immunity, <laughs> and <laughs> you've already decided beforehand That's that you're it. not going to press any charges, that would be a great deal. But I don't think he can fight a subpoena if it comes to that. All right. Thanks, guys. And by well, the way, Mueller's a real yeah. Mueller's a real prosecutor. See. Yeah, he so. actually is a real prosecutor, and he's hiring more people. He hired that cyber crimes expert, which is not a sign that they're closing down this investigation anytime soon. And by the way, guys, have you caught the latest, this guy's latest act? This <laughs> idiot is the president. Well, my response to Bobby De Niro and the Me Too movement targets another actor. Stay tuned. All right, keep it locked here because it's time for our seen and unseen segment where we expose what's really behind the big culture stories of the day. And first up, Robert De Niro, who's truly one of Hollywood's iconic tough guys. But his act isn't so award winning when he talks trash in the real world of politics. This <laughs> idiot is the president. It's the emperor's new clothes. The guy is a f fool. Come on. Our baby in chief has p f in chief, I call him. I think he meant the emperor has no clothes, not new clothes. My gosh, <laughs> if someone doesn't write his lines, he just blows them. That's really incisive. I'm glad, really glad I missed, missed the Falkers. Uh, and uh, that's where we begin our seen and unseen segment with Fox News contributor Raymond Arroyo. Raymond. Uh, this is, he's just been mouthing off for years. And I, someone I've loved, De Niro. A I mean, I've actually, actor. I actually had the chance to take a plane ride with him once. He was oh, really, he was there's really a fun. story. Drinking Jack Daniels like at one in the afternoon, though. He, he can throw him back, but okay. that's a story for another day. Okay. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about this. Uh, he's just off the rails. Well, the, the, he's one of the great actors of his generation. It always, I feel embarrassed for a guy like Robert De Niro. For Godfather, uh, The Wizard of Lies, he recently got awards for. But it undermines the work when you engage in this kind of ad hominem. It cuts your audience in half or more, and it drives people who genuinely, like we us, love, him. love his work. He's a great actor, but don't do this. It embarrasses you. Shut up You're and rambling. act. rambling. And as you said, without the lines, it's trouble. I, you know, they say some actors take the role home with them. He's caught somewhere between Raging Bull and Wizard of Lies. I'll leave it there. Okay. Let's <laughs> <laughs> Catherine Deneuve, cla yeah, I'm going to talk about iconic, beautiful. French actress, amazing, age 74. She's still just as beautiful as ever. Uh, she had a few things to say about the Me Too movement. Sounds like she was reading our angles from recently. Well, she and a hundred other, she and 19, 99 other women signed a letter. This is the backlash to the Me Too movement. Okay. She said, men have been punished summarily, forced out of their jobs, when all they did was touch someone's knee or try to steal a kiss. Mm. As women, we do not recognize ourselves in this feminism, which is beyond denouncing the abuse of power and takes on a hatred of men and sexuality. Mm. Oh, we're a little behind there. Someone's mm. knee or try well, to steal a is. kiss. That's a fun graph. But you know, you know what it is? The, the, the French have a different view of this. They, they take this in totality and, and they're saying, wait, we may have gone too far. Some men have been inappropriately driven from their jobs right. on just an accusation, one that hasn't been proven. A friend of mine said, I guess that there's so, so much for like ever dating someone who you work with. I guess there's just, that's never going to happen again? Because I know people who are married and have six and seven kids who married their husband at work because today no. with the young people are working, that's what they mean. But you can't ever date anybody. Well, and and it look, can't ever go wrong, I guess. And, I don't, and, and these women do go out of their way, these French, uh, and these are authors, actresses, well-known women the in French. The demonization of men. Well, and they go out of their way to say, look, rape is a crime. Of it course it is. Reported. Abuse is abuse exactly. is abuse. But 
Let's not get carried away. This is a part of who Wait, we are as men. No, no. The best ever was Meryl Streep <laughs> last week saying that Dustin Hoffman oh. in 1979, Slapped another her too film, hard. another film I loved. It was hard, it was searing. Kramer that film. versus Kramer. Kramer versus Kramer. That in the scene where he slaps her, he slapped me too hard. Is, it, is that method acting? I always oh, get forget. Right? You are an actor, but no. she slapped too hard. Well, he he is a method actor, and maybe well, she deserved it. I'm not going to. No, but further, I mean, but. this is how pathetic it is. This is how bad it's gotten. Now, Ali Sheedy, the actress from the old, uh, all those old '80s Breakfast films, Club Breakfast Club, and all those Club. '80s movies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she and never did do the Dinner Club. That was an no, actual well, sequel. She uh, ended at breakfast. She actually called out actor James Franco after he was at the Golden Globes Awards, and she said. James Franco just won. Uh, please never ask me why I left TV, the TV and film business. Um, basically saying that he was she, a She claims with two other actresses nightmare. that there was some chicanery going on. One actress on Twitter after he won the yeah. Golden Globe for a movie appropriately called The Disaster Artist. Um, she claims that he made her take her clothes off for a film. Uh, another claims that oh, he like, seduced he, a 17-year-old, which he, he's admitted to. Oh, wait, we have a film out that's a nominated for all these awards of an adult man seducing a 17-year-old boy, and that's called the most amazing... I mean, Call the, Me By Your Name. Call Me By Your Name. I always forget the name of the yeah, film. It was nominated. Well, apparently you can't remember I can't name. call it by its name. <laughs> I can't remember it at all. But that's like the epic art house film of the year. Adult man seducing an underage boy, but James Franco apparently can't... Seduce a 17. Okay. Well, here's the Okay, hypocrisy. I just need to understand these very confusing rules. James Franco got up and accepted his Golden Globe with a Time's Up button on his lapel. Oh. Hollywood undermined itself and its message by giving this guy a Golden Globe when he may be one of the malefactors here, one of the guys they may have to strike from the record. Well, the he, New York Times yeah. today canceled yeah. an event with him because okay, of these charges. Should we play the Colbert? Do we have time? Him on Colbert? No, we don't have time. Oh, Thomas well. says we don't have time. Oh, what a tragedy. He kind of denied the charges. He denied. He, denied. Or, he said, he said, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm here. No, no. This is my favorite. I'm here to listen and learn and change my perspective, don't you know? Where it's, where it's often I'm completely willing and I want to. Oh, again, if someone doesn't write their lines, they're really bad writers of their own. Uh, Raymond, thanks so much, Thank as you, always. And up next, I confront a transgender politician who's led an effort to ban the words he and she from my old home state, Connecticut, Stanford legislative rules. Go away. Okay, stay with me here. The Board of Representatives in the city of Stanford, Connecticut, has voted to ban the use of gender pronouns from its governing rule book. That means people can't be referred to as he or she in the city's written rules. Don't they have bigger problems in Connecticut? One of those who proposed the change is my guest, Raven Mathern, the state's first openly transgender elected official. Welcome, Raven. It's great to see you. How are you? Doing good. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so get me up to speed on the pronouns because okay. in, in New York, you have to use, you can't use he or her or she or him at all. I guess you have to use Z or her, Z-E or H-I-R, or you can use they or there, and you can be fined if you don't use the right pronoun in New York. You actually can be fined. No. So you're not quite there. So no, explain your To situation. be honest, I, I, I'm not too uh, up to date on New York State's laws as I get, my stuff happens in Connecticut. Uh, but really, my goals here, my, the issues that we were trying to tackle were simply the rules of the board. We're not looking to ban terminology. Quite the opposite. I think I lead the charge in allowing people to use their pronouns. I don't want to tell someone, no, you can't be a he, and no, you can't be a she. Quite the opposite. Use what makes you happy. Use what uh, uh, makes you feel right. But you require that people refer to you as... Now, when did you transition? When, when was that? Uh, exactly? So I, I don't like to use the word require. Um, I, I prefer, if someone else is going to use gendered nouns for me that I don't yeah. like, I'm not going to sit there and take offense to it. I mean, there are bigger issues at hand than this. Uh, uh, this issue, what we were doing is... And I, I, I hesitate to even say we, because when I got on the board, when I was elected, yeah. uh, the first issues I wanted to tackle were, uh, and we are tackling, are issues of development not being handled responsibly in our city and things yeah, of crime. that nature. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, crime, these are, development, these are the issues taxes. That, these are what yeah. are actually important. Yeah, um, you know what I, was, Raven, mm -hmm. Raven, you know what I was thinking? I grew up in Connecticut in Glastonbury, not too far, oh, but nice. you know, Beautiful a area. little bit of a drive from, uh, but from you. But Connecticut has, has so many problems. Yes. Losing jobs, <laughs> losing oh my businesses, taxes. Like, I don't care if you're transgender, gay, straight, whatever you are, but if you're in, in politics in Connecticut, save Connecticut. Because yes. Connecticut is yes. going down the tubes, in I my agree. view. So when I read articles about pronoun changes for the rule book and Stanford, I like, my God, I, I keep seeing my happening. face in the newspaper and laughing. I, I think it's a little ridiculous, to be quite honest. Um, when I when I was elected, uh, there were other members of the board. We were we were in the middle of reviewing all of our rules. There was yeah. I want to say something like 30 rule changes we were doing. I could be could be wrong about that, but there are quite a large number of them. And this was one proposed by a couple other people on the board, both Democrats and Republicans, that were looking at it and saying, "Oh, I guess this doesn't really fit, considering who was just elected. So, what can we do to make?" Yeah. The rules more appropriate. So you weren't even the real driving force behind this. There were some like correct. Some I was not feel the good, do good other me members of the board. That's yeah. wild, given all the things that Stanford and all the other towns and cities in Connecticut face. Mm -hmm. That's actually incredible. Like yeah, you so could be someone I, who just tries to work to fix Stanford instead mm -hmm. of focusing on pronouns, which it seems to th it seems to be that you don't even really. You're not really even all that worked up about it. Well, so. what I think what I think is funny is it keeps being said, oh, that we're focusing on it. And meanwhile, when we were at the board of uh, at the January second yeah. meeting of the board of reps, the meeting lasted, I want to say, maybe an hour forty-five or something along those lines. And there were a lot of heated discussions. There were a, there yeah. are a lot of controversial well, topics that we're trying to tackle right now. And this was a tiny little asterisk next to it, yeah. saying, oh, we got well, a transgender elected official, and now the rules yeah. match as well. Okay, well, we appreciate you joining us. We wish you the best of luck. Of and by course, the way, thank you so much. All right, absolutely. And by the way, you know that frequent Trump quit critic, Senator Cory Gardner, who was in that DACA meeting yesterday? Well, he now vows to block the president's judicial nominees over pot. I kid you not. Stay with us. Welcome back. A tale of two senators. That's the subject of tonight's bonus angle. First, Republican Senator Cory Gardner. He's an affable, attractive first-termer from Colorado. He was also one of the members at that big DACA meeting yesterday. That's nice. But did you also know that he's threatening to hold up President Trump's judicial nominees? It turns out that Gardner is upset because Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced that he won't prevent federal prosecutions against marijuana sales and possession, even in states like Gardner's, that has bowed down to the big weed lobby and legalized it. I will be putting today a hold on every single nomination from the Department of Justice until Attorney General Jeff Sessions lives up to the commitment that he made to me in my confirmation, in my pre-confirmation meeting with him. Oh, they had a committed relationship. We've asked Gardner to appear on the Ingram Angle many times since we launched. Same with radio. But he has declined each time. Tucker and Sean don't have much luck getting him on either. Isn't that interesting? But Gardner did have plenty of time on his schedule to appear on MSNBC today. You see, he's one of those Republicans that the New York Times and liberal cable networks usually love. First, he resisted Trump all the way up until August of 2016. And even then, he wouldn't even mention his name. He also never really campaigned for him. He jumped, jumped on Trump after Charlottesville. And when Trump canceled DACA in September, Gardner immediately rushed to back his own bill to save the Dreamers. And now, defending the pot lobby, cloaking it in a bogus states' rights argument. Yeah, well, President Trump, beware of Cory Gardner, especially when it comes to the issue of immigration. Gardner used to talk tough on securing the border first. But now, like so many who came to Washington, he seems to be more concerned with being loved by the in crowd while avoiding tough questions from people like me. I'd be fair and tough. It'd be much better for Cory Gardner to come on this show and answer some straightforward questions. Why hiding? The other person, people who hid were people like Eric Cantor 
and sometimes John Boehner, but they're not around anymore. And then there's Elizabeth Warren. Among her many degrees in law and speech pathology, I'll bet economics is not one of them. Waste Management, a huge company in the United States, announced today that because of the passage of the tax reform bill, they're going to give $2,000, those bonuses, to 34,000 employees. That sounds like great news, right? Who wouldn't want a $2,000 bonus? But here's what Elizabeth Warren thinks of the bill. What we have to do is change it. You got to take out the parts that are giant giveaways to big corporations that right now the Republicans plan for hardworking families to eventually pay for. Now, she apparently doesn't realize former Harvard 